Good afternoon. Welcome to our next session, which is on artificial intelligence in pediatrics. My name is Suresh. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anthony Chang and Dr. Timothy Chow. Anthony notes, needs no introduction. He's the founder of iSpy, uh, a pediatric cardiologist. He directs the uh, heart failure program at Children's Hospital of Orange County, where he also serves as the chief intelligence officer and chief innovation officer. Anthony is very passionate about the transformational value of AI in healthcare, and he works to, uh, uh, to introduce uh, the value and advance the use of AI. Dr. Chow from uh, Stanford is widely acknowledged as a <coughs> pioneer in cloud computing. He launched and taught the first course in cloud computing at Stanford University. He's a 25-year technology industry veteran and has served in senior management and operational roles at uh, Oracle Corporation and uh, Tandem Computers. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Chang and Dr. Chow. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming in, by the way. Um, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I've been hearing a lot about innovation, so I just wanted to present something on the other important I word, which is um, intelligence, or specifically artificial intelligence. Uh, I think there's a lot of hype, and probably it's a good time to have a reality check. And I, I just uh, wanted to thank the organizers, including my, my friends from the last four or five years really pushing the agenda. You met all of them already, and this is the original picture from the first time that we all came together, 22 children's hospitals coming together for the first time, talking about innovation, and that was June uh, about five years ago at the Ritz-Carlton. So, it's uh, a tribute, and I see, still see some of you coming uh, today, so it's a tribute to all of you. So um, why artificial intelligence? Um, I think overall, I think in medicine and healthcare, we could use more intelligence. I think um, these are three scenarios I just briefly share with you. One is a nine-year-old that had, was a cancer survivor and ended up having heart failure and was on the verge of dying in the cardiac intensive care unit. And we, just by chance, tried a new drug at a very high dose. And my feeling was, uh, what if we hadn't tried that? Uh, why is in 2019 that we're still struggling with the best answer in medicine? This is an unfortunate nine-year-old that I met on a consult in Myanmar. And uh, she passed away without having access to um, the highest level of expertise in pediatric cardiology. And this particular young girl it does have a special place in my heart. This is my now six-year-old um, who has uh, critical congenital heart disease. And because her heart is so complex, despite talking to 10 to 20 top-level surgeons, uh, we still cannot come up with what's the best surgical strategy. So these are, and those of you who are clinicians in the audience know that this is an eternal struggle. Um, this past summer, I had a personal um, odyssey with the uncertainties in biomedicine. She was at one of the top heart programs in the country, and yet I get a sense that there's still a lot of art, and maybe too much art in medicine, <laughs> and not enough evidence and intelligence. Here she is recovering um, three days after surgery, and here she is catching up with her sister on the big news that she missed the last three or four weeks away from home. So that's the why. It's a very important why. It's a very patient-centric why that I, I'm pushing, not just innovation, as we have in the past, but it has to be coupled with technology and, and intelligence as well. Now, um, when you look at evidence-based medicine, which has served us well, for us to go forward to precision medicine and population health, as we've been talking about throughout the day, there's a huge information and knowledge gap which has to be made up with a whole new paradigm, which is going to be data science and artificial intelligence-based uh, medicine. And the reason why is we have more data than ever before. And while that sounds good and sounds promising, but without an artificial intelligence-based paradigm to make sense out of the data, uh, we're not going to find the answers that we hope for. So this is a graphic showing you different layers of data and information from um, uh, medical images to genomics to social determinants of health, which I think in the near future will really come together, converge, and bring us um, answers to a lot of questions that we have. So that graphic was 
um, a little bit too complicated. This is an easier way of looking at this. We've been practicing evidence-based medicine, which is above the surface. And 90% of what we need to know in terms of information and knowledge is beneath the surface. So that's what I called um, intelligence-based medicine. Now, I have a challenge here. In 10 to 12 minutes, I'm going to, uh, I just recently finished a whole textbook on this topic, intelligence-based medicine. I'm going to try to get this book down to about 12 minutes with about 15 slides so you get a preview. So we give Dr. Chow plenty of time. <laughs> so a little bit about history of AI. This is um, familiar to you now from the imitation game, the movie. Um, Alan Turing is sort of the father of artificial intelligence. And of course, when I was visiting Bletchley Park um, this past year, I had to sneak across the ropes and sit at his desk. Um, that's Alan Turing's desk. Remember, he formulated a lot of artificial intelligence and broke the Enigma code with a simple typewriter. So I don't want to hear a data scientist complain about not enough compute power ever again. <laughs> so, um, and this is the Dartmouth Conference in 1956 that launched the discipline of artificial intelligence. So three games with computers beating the human champions really, I think, um, pushed the agenda of artificial intelligence. One was the IBM supercomputer beating the Russian champion, um, Boris Spassky. Um, the other is um, Watson beating the human contestants on Jeopardy. That, by the way, was the night that I downloaded the application for the data science program at Stanford. And then thirdly, AlphaGo is a program from DeepMind that beat the human champion at Go. So these are very significant sort of milestones. And for some of you who are hearing artificial intelligence and machine learning and getting a little bit confounded about how these things are related, this is sort of a, a straightforward um, diagram to show you that deep learning is sort of in the, under the umbrella of machine learning, and machine learning is one of the methodologies in artificial intelligence. Uh, very quickly, there are three basic different types of artificial intelligence, assisted. So that's where the um, machine is programmed by humans, sort of think of it as the, uh, a robot performing certain functions. Augmented is what we've been working with a lot. You've heard about IBM Watson for oncology. And um, lastly, autonomous is the type of AI that makes humans a little bit nervous about um, artificial intelligence. That's when the machines sort of need minimal intervention from humans to perform its um, task. And we already have autonomous tools now available. Um, there's a medical image interpretation tool that is now accepted by the FDA for um, medical image interpretation. So three sort of parallel developments that led to the excitement about AI in medicine and also in pediatrics. By the way, I think pediatrics is, because of the heterogeneity of the patient population and the rare diseases and small amounts of data is particularly well suited for artificial intelligence. So one main development was ImageNet or methodologies that relate to the use of deep learning for um, artificial intelligence. The second development that Tim will go into a little bit is cloud computing. He's sort of one of the progenitors of cloud computing. And lastly, compute power with thanks to all the video games out there. So the next time you see your teenage friend or son or daughter playing with um, uh, video games, that actually promulgated the excitement about AI and medicine as well, is the compute power with GPUs. So another way of looking at artificial intelligence was sort of in the current era where we have narrow type of artificial intelligence, so AI that's particularly well suited for certain narrow tasks, like medical image interpretation or game playing. But in this next coming, next decade or two, we're going to see computers getting even smarter and actually can do human-like uh, complicated tasks, and that's going to be coming in the next couple of decades. So just a few words about the three main sort of genres of AI. One is natural language processing, which is how computers and humans communicate. This is a quick schematic of natural language processing and understanding. And what's not on here is natural language generation. And you probably indirectly um, got to know natural language processing because that's sort of part of the engine behind IBM um, Watson for um, different um, games and, and as well as healthcare. 
And underneath the hood, this is what IBM Watson looks like. It's a very powerful natural, natural language processing uh, capability with a search algorithm. Now, an example of this in pediatrics, this was uh, an, an article that got a lot of publicity, which is uh, a huge database in China, and using natural language processing, the um, AI was able to be as good, if not better, than pediatric residents um, figuring out the diagnosis in the emergency room setting and in clinic setting. So natural language processing, again, very powerful for extracting information in electronic record. There's something very exciting called um, Convolutional Neural Network, or CNN. Has nothing to do with Will Blitzer, <laughs> but um, has a lot to do with a very powerful way of looking at medical images to the point where it's superior to human clinicians in the subspecialties like radiology. This is a CNN um, paper written for cardiology. I'm a pediatric cardiologist, so can appreciate how good um, CNN is now for medical image interpretation for cardiology. Uh, this is for dermatology, where skin lesions can be automatically classified into different diagnoses with a simple picture fed into a computer. And by the way, as good or not better than even groups of board certified dermatologists now. So even though I'm talking about comparisons, the whole um, sort of um, emphasis here is really human plus machine being superior to either one. This is a pediatric paper from uh, a group in China looking at using CNN for diagnosing retinopathy or prematurity. So it's a very, very practical application of CNN. Um, this is another um, application of CNN in terms of AR and VR, augmented and uh, virtual reality with 3D um, rendering of anatomy. So in the future, radiologists will be looking at anatomy in a three-dimensional um, situation. This is actually in use. Um, this is myself and one of my cardiology colleagues looking at closing a defect with a device. So we're sort of doing a trial run looking at the images <laughs> And you can see, even in virtual reality, we can't always agree. So that was a little joke, by the way. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Not in the mood. Okay. So, in case you're wondering, this is alternating pictures of. Okay. This gets a funny laugh. Okay. Okay. Alternating images of blueberry muffins and chihuahuas. So, um, as good as computer um, vision is, somehow there are certain challenges like this one. So um, I live with uh, a little girl named Emma. So she, when she was four, I challenged her with, uh, apparently with computer vision, the accuracy is only about 70 or 80% at best because it just can't figure out the interrelationships. Uh, my daughter Emma was 747. So there's still something to be said about human vision compared to um, computer vision. And some of you noticed that I'm teaching her how, how to play the game Go being that her father is an AI um, aficionado, she had to play Go, and this is her smiling with her first move and no longer smiling with her 13th move. So. <laughs> Machine learning is a huge part of artificial intelligence. Think of it as the string section of the, or of the AI orchestra. So I won't have time to go into the nuances, but suffice to say there's basically supervised and unsupervised learning and there's also uh, machine and deep learning. Deep learning is basically a more sophisticated way of doing machine learning to take on more complex tasks, um, particularly in biomedicine. Um, this is a, a very practical use, I'll go back, of um, deep learning and machine learning with ICU data. And um, this is out of MIT. And they actually now run datathons or uh, sessions to look at AI in machine learning with ICU data. Love to see this in pediatrics. I think we already have a virtual PICU through the efforts at CHLA, but we could definitely, definitely duplicate this. This is a Kawasaki disease machine learning project trying to be more accurate about the diagnosis of Kawasaki's um, disease. As you know, sometimes we don't make the diagnosis. This is um, an, a wonderful autism paper using machine learning to diagnose autism um, in a timely fashion in children using just um, video clips loaded up by um, 
by parents. So it totally revolutionizes the way we make diagnoses. As you know, oftentimes autism is not timely diagnosed and sometimes takes even years. So we can definitely expedite um, therapy. Another type of machine learning um, is a recurrent neural network. It's simply building a time element into the data. So any time-related data can be uh, take, uh, taken on by machine learning with RNN. This is a, a paper showing you that in, on the way to an artificial pancreas, we can use serial determination of glucose and determine what the uh, insulin dose should be. So this is glucose prediction with RNN. And lastly, the, the promise of deep reinforcement learning is not to be underestimated. This is essentially now mimicking what clinicians do on a day-to-day -day basis in the clinical setting. So deep reinforcement learning is getting closer and closer to the really smart AI that we all hope for that we will be able to utilize in our clinical practice. So these are some of the um, upcoming types of AI that will be particularly um, uh, useful and practical reinforcement learning, transfer learning, which is what we desperately need in pediatrics. So we can literally transfer uh, knowledge from, for, in, for instance, adult patients with a certain disease so that we can train the computer for children in the future. And deep learning is, is only um, at the beginning. So overall, we're sort of um, looking at birds in flight and we're at sort of the Wright Brothers stage of AI for medicine. And wouldn't it be wonderful 10, 20 years from now realizing that we're venturing out into space, flying higher and faster than any bird can. So at some point um, in our lifetime, we will no longer differentiate machine from human intelligence. We'll simply um, blend them together and be simply called medical intelligence. So um, when AI works, we don't call it AI any longer, and that's what's going to, I think, occur in uh, medicine in the next decade or two. So again, the paradigm is intelligence-based medicine, but we all have to work towards that. It's just not going to magically appear uh, in the next few years. This is a, a wonderful gathering of clinicians and data scientists working um, shoulder to shoulder to solve the um, research questions that the clinicians had. This took place a year and a half ago in Beijing. Um, you can visualize a, a senior clinician, department chair of medicine in Beijing University, working next to a 20-some-year-old uh, data scientist and coming up with answers to questions. And I think that's the future of AI medicine, is working um, together. And as Bill Gibson says, the future is already here, just not um, evenly distributed. So don't miss the Yaya boat. <laughs> and if you're more curious about artificial intelligence and where we're going to be using it in medicine, this is a um, website you can um, check out the many resources that we've loaded up. Um, this is um, thanks to a, a generous donation from the um, Michelle Disney Lund Foundation. All the previous talks from the meeting AMED is loaded up as well as resources and we have our Big meeting coming up this December 11th to the 14th, and I've arranged a 25% discount for any um, iSpy member or anyone who's attended uh, this meeting uh, this week. And I want to thank uh, my generous donor, who is, happens to be the granddaughter of Walt Disney, and also my very, very, very patient mentors, including Tim, um, from uh, Stanford for getting me through the program. And here's my <laughs> contact information if you need it. And that's the entire book in 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so um, I, I need to walk around. So I, I'm going to take the next 10 minutes and talk a little bit about how I think uh, we're going to try to translate what is in uh, Anthony's mind into an engineered reality. So uh, I was introduced as a doctor. I'm not his kind of doctor. I'm the other kind of doctor. So the smart doctor. Yeah, I, yeah. So I've been in the software business for a lot of years, and um, I have a picture of Joni's up here, which, if you've been in Palo Alto, uh, is a nice place to have breakfast. And it was the very first time I met Anthony, and I've always 
been happy to carry also the title of FOA, right? So, friend of Anthony. Um, and uh, he really kind of opened my eyes about both children's medicine and the potential uh, for what we could do here if we work together. Uh, and one of the things that I think he kind of exposed me to was I went and tried to understand, well, what are all the kinds of machines in a children's hospital? And so I came away realizing, boy, there's a lot of different kinds of machines, but more importantly, none of them are connected. And um, so since I've been in the Valley for a lot of years, I mean, I will tell you a story which you do know, which is that basically in 1994, 1995, when we connected about a million computing machines together, that is the dawn of the internet, right? That's the beginning of eBay, Amazon, et cetera. Because if you think about it, if I only had 100,000 machines connected, who would have cared? So in some weird way, a million represents kind of an interesting inflection point. And obviously, since then, we've gone on to build things that no one could possibly have imagined, you know, a Netflix, Lyft, Facebook, Uber, et cetera. So, and you guys know this, there are not a whole lot of children's hospitals in the world, about 500, and it turns out, on average, there's about 1,000 machines, 1,000 MRI scanners, ultrasounds, et cetera. So I started thinking about the question of, well, what would happen uh, if we could connect all the machines in all the children's hospitals on the planet? Uh, we would be at roughly a half a million. So if you believe that there's some inflection point out there at a million, that is really close. So you might ask yourself, well, if we did all this, what could you do if you could connect all these machines? And so I'll tell you, I think there's many things, but I'm just going to give you a couple simple examples. Uh, number one, today, and I, you guys know this, but I was completely shocked, that today when a doctor does a consultation, and the very first time I came to an iSpy executive committee meeting, uh, Anthony said, can I, can I have some time to do a consultation? And we walk into this room. There's a tower PC there. I love telling this story in Silicon Valley, right? There's a tower PC there. We hit the button, the tray table comes out. <laughs> he puts a CD-ROM in there, closes it, and I'm looking at him going, you know, we watch Netflix on our phones. What are you doing there, right? This is crazy, <laughs> right? But as you know, you know, and as I've come to learn, the current world is operated in a very disconnected state. So number one, if we could operate connected, well, we could connect doctors that are in Malaysia with doctors in California, uh, whether that's through some Slack channels or th through some Zoom sessions or whatever, that wouldn't be that hard to do, right? And then obviously, if we could do that, as Anthony just said, we could start thinking about not collaborating with humans, but collaborating with, I like to use the phrase, AI doctors. So, this could end up, and this is actually a phrase Anthony was playing around with, us being able to create a global pediatric imaging center as just one application of a connected world. So you might ask, how would you go about doing this? So I'm going to take you through a fairly simple, and it's actually a project we are running right now. We have a small team that's about to double in size in, on Thursday. Um, and I'm going to explain roughly how we're going to do this. So number one, uh, we're actually going to figure out how to connect all these machines with, in a very innovative way. We're actually going to build what you will ultimately hear. We've not been very public about this, uh, something we're calling an edge cloud. It will be heterogeneous, meaning I can connect to arbitrary different kinds of medical machines. Uh, it will be managed. I'll manage the security, the availability the performance of this network. Uh, it will be engineered to be a cellular first, as many of you heard the 5G uh, story out there. It's a huge opportunity to start to leverage 5G technology as the backbone. It will be a global network, and I think we figured out how to make this free, meaning we will make it free to all the hospitals to connect all the machines in all the children's hospitals in the world. Now, if we do that, step two becomes pretty simple, meaning we now have the capacity to collect tons of data, right? Whether that's 
ultrasounds, MRI scans, EKGs, et cetera, et cetera, in what I'm going to refer to as a center cloud. But the important part is we're going to have to figure out how to label it. And let me show you a simple chart for you to think about this. So um, Anthony talked to you about RNNs and CNNs, but neural networking, which sits at the core of deep learning and at the core of all the amazing things that we've seen on the consumer front, is the fundamental technology that all of this stuff rides on top of. This is actually an interesting chart that Jeff Dean, who runs Google Brain, put together. And I'll describe it fairly simply. It basically says, if I use neural networks and add more data and more compute, I will get greater to greater degrees of accuracy, nearly linear as you see in this chart, right? No other technique's ever been able to do anything like this. So we have the capacity to bring more data in, we have the capacity to bring more compute in, but the one important thing I think we all have to think about is, it's not just any data. This data is going to end up needing to be labeled. And so I actually have a small team already starting to work on a global collaborative labeling mechanism. Uh, we are already reaching out, and I'd be glad if any of you would like to supply any radiologist, image specialist who are interested in this type of project. We want to come up with a workflow and a piece of software that allow us to standardize this on a global basis. Now, if we're able to do that, that is really the linchpin to the last step, which is we will be able to build AI doctors using this. Interestingly enough, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the American College of Radiology last year started to assemble together what they believe are interesting use cases which are amenable to this technique as well as useful. Uh, I actually had Suthan, you saw him earlier, go through the entire list, remove all the, the cases which would have no relevance to kids, like there are a bunch of cases in there on breast cancer, and we've ended up with these 19 cases. We're gonna use these really to kind of be the areas of focus to figure this entire thing out with, and then obviously once we built this, it could be used for many, many other cases. So I would tell you this is just the beginning. I mean, I've just showed you one simple use case, but if we can connect all these machines with modern technology, which, by the way, is not a huge technical problem, right? The number of innovations that I think are going to become possible are, un are uncountable. Just as I told you, the day the Internet arrived and eBay arrived, nobody could imagine all the things that we take for granted today. I believe the same thing is possible if we take this step in this world. So I'm going to hand it back to Anthony. We're going to take it down. So I think basically what maybe the takeaway from Tim and I is that I think um, innovation we've talked about and what promulgated the society is an exciting beginning because it got us together and there's strength in numbers. I think if we think about the other eye, which is intelligence, it sort of enables each other. And I think the exciting thing about pediatrics is we all have an um, important mission to pull everyone together in pediatrics, probably logistically as well as even um, philosophically easier to do than all of the rest of medicine. And we can really be an amazing role model for adult medicine and what they do. So again, um, this is sort of symbolic for me because both my daughters were time-wise related to both um, Pediatrics 2040 as well as AI Med. And I think maybe there's an a good lesson in there for me, which is hopefully um, they will become inseparable. So thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? So let's use our imagination yeah. and what's available and really uh, make something big out of um, the reason why we're here. Um, is, oh yeah, the mic's on. So um, Tim, I have to tell you that my phone was blowing up the whole time you were speaking <laughs> with every Southerner in this audience <laughs> asking, where is he from? We want to claim him. I'm claimable. I grew up in the great state of North Carolina. That's what I said. There you go. All right. Yeah. So that, so that was my first question. <laughs> So the, the, the Southerners need some good news. So um, the second question is, how can we 
how can we help you all, okay? We've got hospitals in here. I know we've got radiologists. We've got physicians. Um, what is your challenge to the members, iSpy members out in the audience and helping you take this forward? What do you need? Want to take that first, Tim? Uh, yeah, I'll, for the, I'll say for this project that we're working on, I think number one is I'd be very interested in any, we're already trying to identify this through ACR, but if you guys know as well, any radiologists, cardiologists, et cetera, who are, um, let's call it um, AI knowledgeable. So if I say words like we need labeled data, they don't look at me funny. So people like that we'd like to connect to because we want to use them to vet a lot of ideas uh, for basically the fundamental infrastructure. That'd be number one. Number two, I think for the leading edge, as many of you are innovation people from the leading edge hospitals, I'd love to get in touch. I don't think we're ready to go into deployment uh, right away, but I think over the next 12 months, um, that's gonna become possible. And uh, I'd like to be able to connect with you and talk about how we're gonna go through that deployment. I think, um Sherry and everybody, there's nothing like losing a patient and you realize a solution could have been in place. And I think that young girl I lost in Myanmar, probably the root of it was lack of access to sophisticated image interpretation that would have you know, come up with a diagnosis. So my, my dream as a tribute to her is to someday that any pediatric caretaker anywhere in the world can upload your image and get an interpretation that's AI enabled so that it basically obviates the need for ivory tower super specialists to interpret any image. And I think we're, we'll see in our lifetime, but it really begins with, as you know, one champion that becomes a dozen champions and move forward. And I have full confidence in iSpy that this could be one of, one of our big dividends for the near future. The technology is ready, the question is, are we going to be able to pull this off? Any other questions? Any other questions? Here. Uh, Marcelo Frakif with Olive. Um, so a lot of what we do is AI as well. And what I hear a lot from our customers when we're talking about the applications of AI, how it interacts with humans, is there's a lot of fear of change management. What does it mean to work together? You know, are there jobs that won't exist? So I guess my question would be, you know, how do you guys view the, that, that harmony existing between the, the two and what that means for better care, uh, specifically within pediatrics? So I'll... Um I'll take your question and change it slightly. So I, I wrote a book ab about this coming IoT, the implications of AI. I did a book launch in, um, in London. And one of the guys in the audience at the end, he raises his hand, he says, well, you know, Dr. Stephen Hawking says that AI will be the death of humanity. What's your comment on that? <laughs> you know, I go, well, you know, I mean, I, I hate to, uh, you know, fly in the face of Dr. Stephen Hawking. But I said, you know, I think at some point, it's how we want to visualize the future. Do we visualize it as a Terminator future or do we visualize it as a Star Trek future? And I'll tell you which one I would choose that it be. I think the path to get there, which is the path we've seen already with technology and software anyway, is augmentation first, not replacement. I don't, for, particularly for these more complex tasks, you know, people have often speculated just how long will it take for autonomous driving to actually happen. It may be much longer than we actually realize. But in between, right, if we can use computers to accelerate, right, the ability to solve the kids, I mean, even right now, frankly, had a doctor been able to see that image somewhere in the world, forget AI, we could have made a huge step with her. And I believe that there's a whole ton of technology that could be thrown at this to augment people's capabilities way before we're talking about replacing them. I think in clinical medicine, um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about potentially radiologists and other image specialists losing their jobs. I'm actually going to predict the opposite. I actually think there'll be more radiologists because the level of sophistication of artificial intelligence to enable and augment the intelligence is going to make the job 
a lot less mundane, a lot more interesting. So some of the young talent that's going into, um, I'm sorry about my, sorry about this remark to my tech friends, but may not be as interested in going to the tech world and actually use their expertise to go into healthcare and medicine. So I think there'll be more radiologists, more cardiologists, because these fields that are image intensive, as well as other fields, will be uh, very much uh, enabled by the technologies that we have under artificial intelligence. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Tim. Big hand for them. Thank you. Thank you.